Ms. Ott, I guess the, uh, the first thing we should talk about is your experience and some of the things that you've done over the course of time to give you a status as not only an expert witness but also a, uh, a renowned writer uh, when it comes to police shooting situations. Well, in my case, it's been training and research, uh, both of which began fairly early. I was the <clears throat> only son of an immigrant jeweler who had survived one armed robbery murder attempt and had used deadly force in self-defense. Uh, part of my training from very early in my childhood was weapons, uh, the how as well as the when. Uh, because of an anomaly of law in the state where we grew up, it was in fact legal for me to carry a loaded weapon concealed inside the privately owned place of business without a permit, and I did so from about the age of 12. Uh, my dad knew a lot of the local cops, lawyers, and judges. I would be sitting around when he picked their brains, and eventually the time came when I started picking their brains. I knew the, the degree of responsibility that came with that. You know, waking up in the morning and you're a 12-year-old kid with a loaded pistol in a, in a high-risk retail store. And I started reading everything I could find, which back then wasn't much. Uh, you had McGivern on fast and fancy revolver shooting, uh, the Stuart Lake biography of Wyatt Earp, and you, you could get a pretty good handle on how to do it, but nothing ever said when to do it. And in talking with the cops and the lawyers, and finding out just how many trick bags there were, and just, just how many of the things you would hear at the gun shop were 180 degrees from reality, I started studying and they showed me how to do it in the legal libraries. And what I found there frightened me even more. Uh, that became the genesis of the book in the gravest extreme. Uh, in the meantime, in the early 70s, uh, I'd begun doing a lot of work in police journalism and firearms journalism, uh, first published in 71. From probably 70, I'll say 73 to 1980, I worked uh, full-time as a uh, journalist emphasis, with emphasis on the law enforcement sector. Uh, this put me in constant contact first with police officers who had been in violent encounters who I would intensively debrief because they were the subject of a story. Second, <clears throat> because those magazines wanted lots of articles and the best available training, the only way for me to analyze the training was to go and take the training. So once I had done the article, there was one more training certificate and one more training experience in my own background. Uh, at about that same time, 1972, I had uh, gotten into part-time law enforcement and had come this close to, to doing it for a career. It was just that I felt I could make more money and learn a lot more and do a lot more good uh, going around the country picking up the, the things that I was picking up. In 1981, I did the, uh, the prototype course for LFI with Ray Chapman at Chapman Academy, uh, the Armed Citizens Program. Prior to that, I had been uh, Chief Firearms Instructor for a Defensive Tactics Institute under John Peters. And at uh, Chapman's urging, in October of 1981, I founded Lethal Force Institute. I had figured I'd you know, teach a class a month or something, and uh, it would be kind of fun. And the next thing I knew, that had become the tail that wagged the dog. I've since become full-time instructor, part-time writer, and still part-time police officer. And somewhere along the line in the late 1970s, I started getting requests to appear as an expert witness for civilians and police who were charged with excessive force or wrongful death in self-defense incidents. At the present time, that's probably 5% of the income and 30% of the work at any given time. Uh, I'll take probably 20 cases a year. A uh, few of which actually go to trial. I'll only take a clean case, and by definition, the clean ones, you know, settle or are dropped. Mm -hmm. uh, the only ones that go to trial seem to be the the ones that are politically motivated or greed motivated or a terrible mistake was made somewhere in the system. Uh, during that period, I also became uh, what's known as a police prosecutor. In my state, we have a program in which someone who has not been to law school but is designated by their agency can get a short period of training and be the prosecutor for the state in violations and misdemeanors. Mm -hmm. And I've been doing that for a couple of years on the side as well. Well, you've uh, written about tens of shooting incidents and probably have researched hundreds. Well, well into the hundreds. Uh, 
what have you learned from those? Is there a, well, first, let me ask you, are there any statistics that are involved in, in the average gunfight, quote-unquote, average? No, whenever you hear uh, the average uh, was this number of shots or that distance, bear in mind there is no central empirical database that's determining every armed encounter. Uh, you do have that in New York City and have had since 1970, the SOP-9 studies. Uh, standard operating procedure number nine was the intensive debriefing of every officer involved in an armed encounter with questions like how many shots were fired, did you use your sights, what position were you in, did you fire one-handed or two. That seems to be fairly unique to New York. We have now the Dick Fairburn study that's ongoing that will gather a lot of data. But at the present time, nationwide, the only real source that we have is uh, the officer's killed summary. And certainly there are valid things to learn from there. But if, if the men who lost the fight were firing 2.3 rounds, do we want to train our officers to expect to fire 2.3 rounds to win, given the fact that some of those men fired 2.3 rounds on the average when they died at the first shot and were never able to respond, when the gun that killed them was their own and they had nothing to fight back with. I would say nationwide it's probably going closer to five or six rounds per participant. And the reason it's not going more is because not everyone has semi-automatics yet. Uh, I see a number of cases where the guns are emptied, sometimes reloaded and emptied again multiple times. Uh, the last three I've gone to uh, cordon was one shot, one hit, one neutralization. But you, you just can't really draw a trend on that. Uh, you can get a, a good idea of what cartridges and what guns work and what guns don't. You'll find that there, there are certain trends. Typically it was some sort of a mistake by someone that got you into the situation. Uh, not necessarily a culpable, culpable mistake, but simply a failure to realize that this human being had gone feral and was prepared to take your life. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, what happens in a gunfight situation? Uh, First of all, from a physical sense, it, what's the best way to approach it? Now, obviously, like you said, you're in the wrong place at the wrong time or you haven't evaluated the situation correctly. Uh, but here you are in a situation and um, all of a sudden there's a gun pointed at you. Okay, well, first, uh, understand the physio-psychological phenomena that may occur. Uh, these are distinct from psychophysiological phenomena in that something psychophysiological would begin in the mind and manifest itself in the body, a, a stress-induced ulcer, for example. What we're talking here is something that begins in the body, the adrenal dump, the, uh, the fight-or-flight reflex, if you will, that manifests itself in the mind and the, and the mind's perception of what's going on around you. You can expect, because it happens to the great majority, though of course nothing's 100%, uh, the tachypsychia effect, spelled T-A-C-H-Y-P-S-Y-C-H-I-A, -S -S the most commonly misspelled and misused term probably in the <laughs> business. Uh, it's not an overall term for everything that happens to you, including the tunnel vision, etc. Uh, the tachypsychia is one, refers to one specific phenomenon, the distortion of perceived time. Uh, probably any of your listeners who have been in a car crash, uh, a violent encounter, uh, seeing the baby starting to fall from the high chair. You can recall experiencing that in slow motion. Mm -hmm. uh, the term tachypsychia comes from the Greek. It means literally the speed of the mind. Oh, and you would think at first some of the psychologists wrote in and said, well, why don't you call it Brady psychia? Because uh, Brady is the prefix that means slow. Uh, the reason is that it, the, the, the original term is in fact accurate. I did not coin it. It's a medical term. Uh, it was given to me by Dr. Glenn Dalrymple of Little Rock. The uh, thing that's happening is that as, as the fight or flight reflex begins, the, the primal survival instinct is channeling all the mind's powers toward the singly focused task of survival. Uh, we, we normally use perhaps the 10% tip of the iceberg of the conscious mind, and when suddenly you know, many times that degree of, of mental power is brought to bear on a single focus, it creates almost the, the illusion that it's as if you've been watching life through a Kodak camera and suddenly someone put on a motor drive. Uh, so many more things are being rapidly processed by the mind, so many per more perceptions are being realized so quickly that it creates the illusion that everything's happening in slow motion. 
Uh, we warned our people about that because first some of the people who felt it said that it, it terrified them to feel that they were being slowed down like they were moving through jello, like, like someone in a nightmare. Or like you're in a dream, yeah. You yeah. go slowly. Yeah, you see the same thing in a dream state. And um, we remind them that, look, things aren't slowing down, you're probably moving faster than you ever did in your life, and so is the other SOB. Uh, you don't have all that much extra time to take here. Um, we warned them about that also because, you know, if, if there's been a video camera going in the bank during the shooting, and someone asks you, gee, Lenny, how long did the shooting take? And you say, oh, God, a minute, two minutes. And the video camera shows eight seconds. You're proven to be a liar. And from that point on, your credibility in this case is gone. Uh, we tell our students, do not answer, respectfully decline to answer any specifics, specific questions as to how long did it take, how many feet and inches was the person away from you, exactly at what point on the compass was he coming from, exactly how many shots were fired, because your perceptions will be so distorted by the danger, but so distorted by the near-death experience, because remember, you were the victim that you would be literally the worst possible witness. It, it ill serves the truth of the investigation to uh, peg the decisions on what the victim perceived at the moment the victim had to fire in self-defense. So here you are, someone's got a gun pointed at you. Um, you hear a lot of times that you're going to revert to your training. Does that seem to hold true? If, if there is anything that all of us in the business agree with, and you'll have uh, some who say use a gross motor movement for this and others will say no you can use a complex psychomotor skill for this uh, some will say shooting on isosceles and others will say a weaver some will say revolver some will say automatic 357 45 what none of us argue is that under stress you'll become a creature of your preconditioning a creature of habit a creature of training it's not frankly just the training that does it uh, if you have, if you were trained properly but reverted to a bad habit and kept doing the bad habit, the bad habit will come to the fore. Uh, it, it will be as if the mind goes on automatic pilot. It will, it will seek an autonomic response. If you have inculcated the appropriate autonomic response, if you have drilled and trained, and the, the general rule among the physiologists is an, a complex psychomotor skill, that is where many subtle things must be done at once exactly right, and shooting most certainly is a complex psychomotor skill. Mm -hmm. That it takes approximately 3,000 repetitions to create that autonomic response, uh, unconscious competence, if you will, function on automatic pilot. Whether that's necessary for all of it, I would have to argue. Uh, I've talked to too many men who said they, had, they were in a dangerous job or living in a dangerous neighborhood. They had foreseen themselves one day being in a violent encounter and had made to themselves the commitment, if I'm shot, I'm not going to go down. If I'm stabbed, I'm not going to fall. If I'm hurt, I'll keep fighting. Now, it's kind of hard to do 3,000 repetitions of that. But when well, the first time it happened, the, the psychological suggestion had been so powerful, the plan in place had been so strong, the determination, the human determination, the human will, that given stimulus A, I will perform response A, it worked. And every single one of the ones who had had that in their mind, unless they had in fact received a physically debilitating and crippling wound, were able to respond. And of the ones who told me, well, there was the shot, I fell back, I thought I was going to die, oh my God, that uh, these almost invariably were the people who had never actually thought it would happen to them, had, had never planned for this kind of a crisis. It's, it's sort of like, really, I guess, any human emergency, when you see the... Uh, Okay, you're, you're at a beach and someone collapses with a heart attack. Okay, the person who could never front, confront their own mortality is going to stand here quivering and screaming and someone's just going to have to push them out of the way. And the person who's trained in cardiopulmonary resuscitation will automatically move them into position, clear an airway, start the breathing, go into the right rhythm. And that is a function of the the response that they intentionally brought into place. I've never yet met a person who has performed cardiopulmonary resuscitation who was ever able to actually count the compressions versus the breaths. It was just the body went into that learned repetition that had been learned on the dummy resuscitation, 
and really that I think distinguishes training from education. Uh, our programs encompass both. Education is knowledge. And when I go into this next classroom here with a video, t watching video right now, and I share with them, all right, these are the patterns of encounter. Okay, these are some of the tactics we're seeing used among the armed robbers, the muggers, the da 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 da. That's education, that's knowledge. Some, one more tactic to put in the bank. When we take them out on the range, when we drill them with the, the deactivated guns and the heavily gloved hands on the weapon retention and disarming, no matter how the man grabs your gun, this is the movement that brings it back. Mm -hmm. Those constant drills, those repetitions that will create that autonomic response are training. Training, distinct from education, is a physically programmed response. And I believe that the discipline known as officer survival encompasses both. Let's go ahead and talk about uh, weapons, the gun in particular, and then a little about ammunition. Uh, but first, the controversy of uh, 9 millimeter, 45, 10 millimeter, 41. I mean, it, it's gone on and on. What's the best gun for uh, a street combat shooting situation? First, it's one that's street proven, and that lets out at this time the 10 millimeter, and particularly the 10 millimeter light and the 40 caliber. Uh, they have excellent ballistic potential, but the, uh, at the time of this interview, there was no recorded shooting with the 40 Smith & Wesson, no recorded shooting with the 950 or 1,000 foot second FBI load. Of the five we've been able to access with the full power 10 millimeter, two or three were dismal, and a couple of them were mediocre at best. It appears that the, the current emphasis on deep penetration has resulted in a bullet that projects its energy over a very long and a very narrow cone. Uh, you can take a heavy bodybuilder, and if you're shooting front to back in a defensive situation where he's in an aggressive posture, a bullet that will penetrate 18 or 24 inches of uh, flesh simulant is by definition going to spend a good part of its energy and a good part of its destructive force outside the body you're trying to incapacitate. The uh, I would frankly rather carry a 9mm than a 10mm simply because I know what the bullet will do. Uh, there are a great many 9mm loads that justify its uh, reputation as an impotent man stopper. There are also a handful of 9mm loads that are extremely effective and are street proven. Uh, in the standard stuff you can buy over the counter, the Federal 9BP, 115 grain hollow point. We just don't find any of the cases we find with other brands and other bullet designs where the guy has taken 12, 13, 14 rounds and stayed on his feet up and running. What's the, the difference? What, what, makes, what sets that apart? I think consistency, uh, uniform depth of penetration, uniform expansion. Uh, the bullet goes as far as it needs to go and no farther. And it reliably expands and uh, destroys the tissue in its path. Uh, some of the bullets just zip right through in and out with no expansion. Uh, you might as well have stabbed the guy with an ice pick. Uh, human tissue is elastic and closes back to a degree over the area if it hasn't been chopped through. Um, in the 9mm, the round that I carry is the Corbon. Uh, that's a 115 grain. Uh, it's a factory loaded round, uh, premium ammunition from the people who make the Corbon big game hunting ammunition. It's expensive, uh, about 25 bucks a box for 50, but it's more than worth it to me. What makes that unique? Indeed? What makes it unique is, first, a very efficient bullet, the uh, Sierra Jacketed Hollow Cavity 115 grain. Second, a unique uh, proprietary gunpowder that allows greater than plus P plus velocity at only plus P pressure. Uh, the uh, the 9mm Corbon out of a short barrel compact Glock 19 will hit about 1,340 feet per second, uh, about 1,350, 1,360 out of the, uh, the conventional service size gun. That compares to 1,050 to 1,100 with the standard 115 grain bullet. In short, it's exceeding distinctly the destructive power of 110 grain 357 Magnum and coming this close to the 125 grain 357 Magnum which Evan Marshall's research from street gunfights and mine both confirm is probably the single most likely round to stop a fight with one shot solid center hit. The uh, Corbon, because of the unique gunpowder charge, has virtually no muzzle flash at night and very little more recoil than the standard round. 
unfortunately, most people don't even know it exists. And how do you spell Corbon? Uh, that's capital C O R capital B O N. And that available over the counter? Or? Uh, if you have a gun dealer who uh, knows where to get it, yeah. Uh, I became a distributor. One of my rules in life was, you know, as a gun uh, writer, testing these guns, these holsters, these scopes, this ammo. If the stuff was junk, I'd say it's junk. And I think that's where I built my reputation, for being honest. If it was good, I'd say it's, it was good. If it was outstanding, I said it was outstanding, and I would buy the test gun and keep it. And if it was phenomenally good, I would get a dealership or a distributorship and sell the damn stuff. <laughs> I became a distributor of Corbon. Okay, let's compare that 9 millimeter, 115 grain round to the uh, 45, 230 grain hardball, factory hardball. What's the difference there? I mean, uh, people survive or swear on the 45, but it is a, a military round. Is that, is that hardball going to do as much damage or less? Uh, I would say it would do less. The, uh, the 45 hardball's reputation as a man stopper was built primarily on the battlefield. And when you're talking a situation where, first, autopsies are never done. Second, the shooting of the enemy soldier is never investigated, documented, and confirmed. It becomes a sea story, if you will. <laughs> and finally, there are different physio-psychological dynamics involved. Uh, to, in the year 1944, let's say, to, to shoot a half-starved, rice-fed, despondent man who you know, weighs about 130 pounds is one thing. He may well go down without a whole lot of firepower. <laughs> to shoot a 250-pound, well-fed, adrenaline-high, methamphetamine-spiked Caucasian who wants you to die is a whole different ballgame. And that second guy is going to take a whole lot more lead and a whole lot more destruction to bring down. Uh, that's why the, the battlefield stories we give less weight to simply because there are different tactics, different dynamics involved than what we're training people for, which is dealing with people at very close range on American streets, uh, very likely, more likely than ever in our country's history, to be artificially jacked up on this, that, or the other uh, drug. What, uh, if you were to carry a 45 for self-defense, what round would you recommend? I often do carry a 45, and in cold weather, that is the gun I recommend. Why, why that in cold weather, and what round? Cold, well, first, uh, cold weather is one of the factors no one seems to, to have taken into account. Uh, in cold weather, a number of things change. First, there is vasoconstriction in the body. Okay, there is simply less blood flow at any given point. Therefore, the individual shot, if he has been exposed to cold weather for a while, will take longer to hemorrhage, longer to exsanguinate, longer to show the effects of traumatic shock, longer to show the effects of hemorrhagic shock. Second, the heavy clothing that he's wearing, particularly if the man is wearing several layers, let's say, of fiber fill, uh, can actually blunt some of the force of the bullet and slow down and reduce the energy before it strikes the underlying flesh. Almost act as a vest. Right. Uh, well, I wouldn't say, uh, let's say it's a buffer. Yeah. Uh, less than a vest. Uh, second, the copper jacket at hollow point, the fully copper jacket at hollow point and the auto-loading pistol will have a cookie-cutter effect when it strikes the fabric, when mm -hmm. it strikes the clothing. In effect, little tiny wads or plugs of that clothing will build up inside the hollow cavity as an inert uh, substance. Now, the, the hollow point was designed to open from the inside out as it meets the, the elastic resistance of living tissue, forcing it outward. By the time that's plugged by inert, non-elastic material, when it strikes the underlying flesh, it, in effect, is flat-nosed hardball. Mm -hmm. And I think the history, both of military battle and police gunfights, shows us that hardball round, that is jacketed round nose for jacketed round nose round, the 9 millimeter is justly infamous as an impotent man stopper, and the 45 is justly famous as, eh, being a pretty good man stopper. And I figured for my guys up in, uh, you know, northern New England, where for at least a third of the year, anyone you encounter is likely to be wearing heavy clothing. If their bullets were going to turn into hardball a third of the time, I wanted them to turn into big hardball. Right. Um, for that reason, uh, if I'm in a cold climate, I make a point of carrying a 45. If I'm in a tropical or subtropical climate where that's not in effect, I am perfectly comfortable carrying a 9mm 
with all the technical and firepower advantages that the contemporary Wonder 9 technology offers the user. Okay, then. So for the 45 itself, in summary of that, uh, you, you like the hollow point. I like the hollow point for virtually any round that you're going to use. The, the hard ball in the 45 will literally go through two men front to back and lodge in a third with, with a shot through the thorax. Uh, I don't say that facetiously. If you look at Dr. Fackler's study of the, that bullet through flesh simulant, and you count up the number of inches of tissue that are actually involved in chest hits, you could have three men standing in line at a, at a ticket counter, and the bullet will go through the first perforating, through the second perforating, and lodge midway through the third. Uh, what we're seeing in the actual gunfights is right at three-quarters over penetration. Uh, when I say perforation, that means the bullet's gone all the way through as opposed to penetration where it's gone deep into the body but stayed there. Now, the reason it's only three-quarters is very often the shot was lateral. Let's say you were to fire at me as I was rolling back, the bullet hits the hips, it may uh, go through some heavy bone which will slow it down and have to go through a great deal of flesh or through an arm into the chest and stops just on the other side. Uh, those are the ones that stay in. If even given those variable dynamics, 70, 75 percent of the time it's going through, we've got some real danger to anyone on the other side, and we have the, the basic energy dump factor that no one who has seen a man or an animal shot will argue. But when you see the man or animal shot, and they appear to jerk violently uh, as if they've been kicked or punched, uh, you will almost always find a bullet lodged on the other side. It's, it's junior high school physics 101, uh, with the bullet that stayed inside dumped all its energy and spent its energy there. When the man or the animal just appears startled as if by the shot or shows no reaction at all, usually you'll find an exit hole on the other side. In simple physics, uh, the bullet went in one side, out the other, and bumped them on the way through. Uh, our job is not to kill, our job is to stop. In the hunting field, I, like any experienced hunter, I deliberately choose deep penetrating bullets. I may have to take a shot up the, the long bipedal, quadrupedal creature's body. I might, uh, I even if I've had a broadside shot, I want a large hole on each side, as, as Elmer Keith put it, uh, air rushing in and blood rushing out. Uh, creates, if the object is to kill, which it is in the hunting field, the more air rushing in and the more blood rushing out creates the more hemorrhage, the more pneumothorax, tension pneumothorax, hemothorax, all of which will shut down the vital life support and guarantee death. It also will not happen quickly. Uh, the deer shot through the heart with a 30 out 6 can easily run 200 yards before it collapses. If deer shot back, Lenny, none of us would go in the woods and give them a hard time. <laughs> We're talking about things that shoot back. If it goes down now and stops giving me a hard time, I've won. And if it dies, it dies. If it lives, I'm even happier. I, I don't have a death on my conscience. Uh, therefore, for anti-personnel ammunition, what we're recommending is something that will predictably stay inside the human body instead of exiting the other side, the opposite of what you need for hunting big game. Uh, you hear people say that never in history has anyone been hit by a bullet that went through someone else. That's a crock. That anyone who tells you that hasn't looked too damn far in the history books. You could go back into the last century you'd find that McCall's bullet that uh, murdered Wild Bill Hickok exited his head after passing through a lot of heavy bone and struck and severely wounded another man in the Deadwood Saloon. Uh, you'd find that the bullet that uh, killed Morgan Earp in, uh, in the pool hall, uh, subsequent to the O.K. Corral shooting, exited his body and struck another bystander, wounding him. In this past year, in the past 12 months before this filming, we have one police officer shot to death in Pennsylvania by bullets that passed through the body of the felon fired by other officers because the felon's body blocked the officer's view of their brother officer behind him. Officer Valentine was killed by bullets that had exited the suspect. You have one shooting here in the Los Angeles area of a, a highly touted bullet that would have lots of penetration. Just what you need, folks. Trust us, it works on the gelatin that passed through the felon wounding him and struck the innocent woman unseen in the darkness behind him, killing her. You have one in Arizona where the bullet passed through the body of the felon and struck and killed a campus police officer. That's three in one year and those are just the ones I know of. And the, Remember, there's no empirical database that collects them all. 
And Lenny, that's too big a price to pay. I want a bullet that will stay inside the body of the offender where it will do the most disorienting, neutralizing shock, where it will the least endanger people on the other side. Uh, many of your regular viewers are into sports shooting and have, have seen your fine videotapes on Bianchi Cup and Steel Challenge and all that. And they know the rules of safe shooting. And the first rule you learn when, it, when you ever go to a range is backstop. You never unleash the bullet unless you know where it's going to stop. None of those people who watch your videotapes would ever go to a shooting range that had a sign up and said, do not shoot armor-piercing ammo, it will go through the backstop, and then fire the armor-piercing ammo. What possesses them to go on the street where the only safe backstop is the body of the offender, and innocent people have to be presumed to be walking behind him, and use a bullet designed to penetrate 18 inches of solid flesh? I must profoundly disagree with that. And so, hence, it's the uh, hollow point round that you suggest. We strongly recommend the hollow point. There are a lot of exotic rounds that are designed for extremely low penetration and wide destruction. But basically, some have problems in quality control, some have problems in design. One used to be superb, and the quality control and the design have since gone down the chute. Is that the Glacier? Uh, I, I'd rather not mention brands. And at, the, at this point, I'm just much more comfortable recommending a good conventional jacketed hollow point for the semi-automatic, semi-jacketed hollow point for the 357 Magnum, and lead semi-watt cutter plus P hollow point for the 38 Special. Okay. In, um, in home shootings, in home defense, what happens there usually? What, what, what is there, uh, what, what's the general rules, I mean, of safety? If I was uh, preparing for uh, home defense, what should I keep in mind if I were to confront I would keep in mind what we call at Lethal Force Institute the the Alamo concept uh, don't go looking for them force them to come to you where you're ensconced now the, the Alamo might be a lousy example because we remember that all the defenders of the Alamo were killed but what I'm looking at here is the fact that you, you had 188 raggedy ass freedom fighters in that little San Antonio mission in 1836 uh, you could, could have counted on your fingers the number that knew anything about even rudimentary military tactics. They were surrounded with a supply of perhaps four or five days worth of food, water, and ammunition, and for 13 days stood off 6,000 of the most highly trained battle-hardened troops in the Western Hemisphere. They did it because they were ensconced defenders. The, the others to reach them had to expose themselves to come across the open plain under the rifle sights of the Texans and the Tennesseans. The Texans and the Tennesseans, certainly the others knew where they were, but the primitive artillery of the time could not effecti effectively neutralize. The Mexican army had to charge forward and attack. By the time the Alamo had fallen, we, we don't have complete casualties. Uh, we do have the number of dead on both sides. Uh, on the San Antonio side, it was 188. On the other side, by the, before, not counting the wounded, not counting the sick, not counting the missing in action, each of the defenders before they had fallen had killed 8.5 of the enemy apiece. I would submit to you that, first, there are not 6,000 scumbags outside your apartment waiting in line. They are not under the command of General Santa Ana, who was known to decimate his troops for uh, reasons of discipline, that is, to at random shoot one out of ten men in the company that he felt had displeased him and had not fought effectively enough. I would submit to you that long before the 8.5th has fallen on your staircase, the other side will have followed the advice of the great police instructor Arthur Lamb and reconsidered their negative attitude and left the situation. I, I think the big thing for the citizen to remember is don't try to be a hero, don't do a house clearing. Once you've called the police, don't try to grab the guy yourself. You've just contaminated the area. The police are now coming in expecting an armed man. Look, there's one now. Uh, common sense, simple common sense. We, a lot of the things that we do, I'm not going to put on a videotape because neither you nor I can control a videotape. I can control the students who come to LFI, all of whom have to have total proof of criminal record and character background check. I will tell you this, our definition of tactics is very simple. It's common sense applied with a specific knowledge of the involved discipline. You've talked about and written about distance 
how important it is uh, to maintain and keep your distance. And, and really, what you said earlier here about the, uh, the armed citizen in his house is not to go looking for trouble, just to stay your ground. How close, if you are threatened, can you let someone get to you uh, before you really have the right, the ability, the fear to take that shot to protect your life? Is there a distance? The, the doctrine at law is first measuring by the yardstick of the reasonable and prudent man. What would a reasonable and prudent person have done in the same situation knowing what the defendant knew? The educated person has a whole lot better buffer zone than the average. Uh, most people believe that for you to be enough of a danger to me with this knife, for me to be authorized in using my 45 revolver, or in this case, Sig Sauer P220, you would have to be as close as you are right here. And by that time, we're both hemorrhaging all over the place, and I may or may not get the last laugh, but it's going to be a very hollow victory. The fact of it is, and there's no need to belabor the point here because your viewers can get the excellent tape that, uh, that you offer where I had the privilege of introducing Sergeant Dennis Tuller. It was Sergeant Tuller who in 1983 first quantified the fact that the average person, not an athlete, not a, a, a superstar on methamphetamines, but the average person can close seven yards, 21 feet, and kill with a knife in 1.5 seconds or less. If the weapon is a longer weapon, a, uh, a baton, let's say, or a crowbar, the time would actually be less. The longer weapon is the length of the arm, that much farther reach, one less step he would have to take. And if a man that distance began to move on me, I would start shooting at that point. The uh, knowledge is power. You know, the, the more knowledge you have in this regard, the more defensible you are. I would urge anyone watching this tape to uh, check Lenny McGill's catalog Catch the one where Dennis Tuller explains how that was quantified and where we show how you can quantify it for yourselves and put that sort of in your survival battery. Okay, so uh, now you've determined that you need to use lethal force to protect your life. And I say your life, not your property, because if the guy's running out the uh, door with your TV set, you obviously you shouldn't shoot him, should you? No, the... Uh the, the gun permits still issued in some parts of the country that say for protection of life and property have lied to you. No, nowhere in America do the moods of the courts allow the taking of life for what the courts call mere property. Uh, whether I kill you for your stereo or to keep mine, I still killed you over a stereo. Our law does not permit that. Uh, you may use deadly force only in defense of human life, innocent life, when an immediate, otherwise unavoidable danger of death or grave bodily harm. Okay, so here is uh, this methamphetamine uh, crazed individual charging at you now, and he's coming within that seven foot parameter, seven yard parameter. What do you do? I mean, are you, are you really able to aim at that point? Are you able to uh, refer to training? Are you bringing the gun up into your sights? Are you just yanking on the trigger? I mean, what, what normally occurs in a gunfight? What, what's going through someone's head? The average citizen who well, may the, not have trained a lot. The, do you want the winners or the losers? Well, <laughs> let's hear both. What happens to the losers? What happens to the winners? Uh, among the winners, a significant number, uh, a number so great they can't be ignored, will recall having aimed the weapon and referenced the sights. Uh, for, from Jim Cirillo, who's probably, uh, when they do the history of gunfighting in the 20th century, will rank with uh, Earp and Masterson in the history of the 19th. He recalled in his first gunfight, seeing the, the front sights so intensely that he could recall every groove and striation on the front side. Cirillo fired three shots, three hits, three neutralizations in three seconds. And that's not a war story, folks. I got that from his commander, Joe Volpedo, at the New York Stakeout Squad in 1972. Uh, we found in the, uh, the comparisons in Los Angeles of the officers who had trained privately in the pilot groups with uh, officers Helms and Mudgett in the new pistol craft techniques that uh, they were winning a much higher percentage of gunfights than the officers trained in ordinary techniques. In my opinion, the Weaver versus Isosceles and things like that had little to do with it. Virtually all of those men said they had become programmed. When that gun comes up, I will focus on the front sight, I will put the bullet where it has to go. Um, if I could give you any bit of advice that 
based on all the studies, all the people, all the survivors I've debriefed, would guarantee putting the bullet in the right place. It would be front sight. Uh, of the ones who have uh, lost, a large number will describe point gun, pull trigger, point gun, pull trigger. Uh, from me to you, that may or may not work, but not all of them will be from me to you. The, uh, the fact of it is, the gun is a remote control drill. The, the old gunfighters used to refer to drilling their opponent. Well, the drill has to be indexed, and instead of a, a palpable drill bit that we apply by hand manually, the gun being a remote control bit has to be indexed visually. It has to be indexed by the, the al visual alignment of the sights. If, uh, if drilling from the hip, as it were, worked, then in every uh, drill press factory in America, the guys working on piecework would go boom, boom, boom from the hip. <laughs> but none of them would ever get paid because none of the piecework would turn out to have the holes in the right place. And whenever you see a case, it seems of, uh, well, the guy was shot 27 times and stayed up, and you find that, you know, 24 of the 27 times there were peripheral hits. You'll debrief the guy, and he'll say, well, no, there wasn't time to aim, there was time to point the gun. Well, that's bullshit. If there's time to point the gun, there's time to aim. Uh, certainly, the, the survival instinct will make you focus on the, on the danger. The only way you can overpower any instinct is through constant training. One of the things that we train, because we can never guarantee that our guys will have their 3,000 reps uh, fresh in their mind and fresh in their firing muscle neurons at, at the time they need it, is a technique we call stress point index. Uh, sort of a cross between the old point shooting and the, uh, the conventional sight picture. We're raising the gun high, intruding it into the cone of the tunnel vision with the primary focus on the target, the secondary focus is on the gun itself, and it gives us a much cruder alignment. Uh, the sights, instead of looking like this, will look like this, but it's a very crude, fast alignment, and it's much less crude than the body position index of hip shooting or point shooting. And we find that also will work extremely well. When you are and have to shoot an individual, where should you aim? What, what are you really aiming for? It depends, again, what you're doing. Um, first, the, the finer the aim, the more likely the hit. Uh, there's a saying among hunters that works for any other living organism, it seems. Uh, they say if, if you aim for the deer, you'll probably miss the deer. If you aim at the deer's chest, you'll probably hit the deer. If you aim for the deer's heart, you'll probably hit the deer's chest. And if you aim for the right ventricle of the deer's heart, you'll probably hit the heart. The guys I know who are heavy hitters who have been in multiple gunfights are not looking for an X-ring. They're not looking for a gross body aim. They're looking at you like a CAT scan, and they're going hard in a spine. Uh, against another man with a weapon, uh, a remote control weapon, uh, let's say another man with a gun, I would follow the old advice of aim for the center of mass. God, how I hate that phrase. <laughs> but uh, the fact is, knowing how stress degrades marksmanship, it gives you the greatest probability of a hit that will disable life support. And well, what you've got to do is keep this trigger finger from flicking. Life support is what you have to attack. If the man was coming at me with a knife or a club, a contact weapon, I would blow out the pelvis. I would go immediately for the pelvis. The reason is the, the bullet through the heart does not kill all that quickly, unfortunately. It's, uh, it, it, even if it's blown out of the body, the individual may remain up and running for 14, 15 seconds. When the pelvis has been shattered, not merely cracked, but shattered, which is run, one reason I don't care for the low-power defensive loads like the 380 automatic. They can't reliably do that. When the pelvis is shattered within one step, the organism is down. You've taken out the, the cross member, the axis of body support. Uh, if it was a victim rescue shot, uh, the man is not looking at me and therefore won't see the gun and can't duck. But the victim's on the ground, and he's got to be stopped. I would probably go for the head, uh, from the side into the ear, from the front up the nose, uh, from the back into the base of the skull. Uh, ignore the old conventional wisdom about center of forehead or between the eyes. Uh, that may be where you think, but that's not where you live. Uh, where you live is in the uh, medulla oblongata uh, and the band through here. 
a bullet through there in, in the human seems to cause an immediate drop. There may be some light post-mortem spasm, but not much. A bullet high in, higher in the brain will cause what some of the neurologists and neurosurgeons refer to as an electrical storm in the neuros in, in the uh, uh, central nervous system. Uh, you'll find this in uh, Carlos Hathcock's book, Marine Sniper. Uh, he refers to having shot men in the brain with a high-powered 308 rifle, and the body is still violently spastic because the bullet had not, in fact, reached primal brain and, and shut off the light switch. Uh, again, it, it's situational. Uh, we don't believe in keep it simple stupid here simply because that was a concept developed for draft soldiers who would not question the commands of men sending them into a battle which had a 40 or 50 percent acceptable casualty rate. Our acceptable casualty rate is zero. We recognize that violence is not simple and a complex variety of danger requires a complex repertoire of response. I've read in some of your articles that, um, particularly the articles about police officers, that a lot of them, a high percentage of them, seem to be shot in the right hand. These are right-handed shooters. What's going on there? What's happening? Uh, why are they receiving those wounds in the, in the right hand especially? I think you'll see that on both sides, uh, not just the cops. And what it is, the, the person who's not deeply trained perceives the threat to be the weapon. Uh, they forget uh, Jeff Cooper quoting uh, John Steinbeck. Uh, the gun is not the weapon, the mind is the weapon. The gun is just a tool. Uh, when someone sees me coming up toward them and sees a pistol, the, the reaction would be, GUN! And you focus on the gun. Uh, where the head goes, the body follows. Uh, you'll find it's something as simple as a dualatron target exercise, where you're shooting at the cartoon targets of bad guys. The shots will cluster toward the weapon. Your trained professional in what we call threat management uh, will look at the opponent and will see the CAT scan of that body and will aim at the part of the body he intends to destroy. Uh, this is why you, you saw it today when you came by to, to do this filming. Uh, we had our students out working with weak hand draws, one hand only reloads, with both hands actually, but as you saw with the weak hand, simply because that is a high probability factor. Uh, when you look at what became really the OK Corral shooting of the 20th century, the, the Miami Massacre, of April 11, 1986, uh, probably the most intensively studied gunfight in, in social, modern society's history, you saw Agent McNeil shot in the gun arm in the opening of the encounter. Agent Morales, as he's coming to bring his shotgun to bear, the left arm is shattered. You had Agent Hanlon uh, down attempting to reload when the bullet strikes him in the gun arm. Uh, the subject, uh, Platt, uh, two to three times, is struck in the gun arm himself. Uh, the gun arm finally rendered inoperable, interestingly, after multiple wounds, uh, one of which was the famous uh, bullet that cut the pleural ar pulmonary artery but didn't reach the heart. Uh, one bullet, believed to have been fired by Agent Reisner, shattered the wrist, and at this point, the killing stopped. Uh, Platt had to uh, access a 6-inch 586 revolver, uh, firing left-handed, and having lost a great deal of blood and apparently not being accustomed to left-handed shooting, at very close range, missed three shots at Agent Morellis, who was then able to close the distance, and with his shattered left arm hanging at his side, firing right-hand only, ended the gunfight by killing Platt and the suspect Maddox. Uh, for that reason, because it, anything that's high probability has to be dealt with in training. For that reason, we emphasize weekend shooting as a survival skill as opposed to an advanced technique. Mm -hmm. You are a, uh, a well-known shotgun shooter. You have a shotgun videotape available. Uh, what do you think about the shotgun and its role in self-defense for individuals and, uh, uh, and how it's, its role in gunfights? I see it in, in home defense as an auxiliary weapon. Uh, if you were to have only one gun for home defense, I strongly believe it should be a handgun. Uh, the problem with a shotgun is if you do have to move with it, let's say to gather the children and bring them into the safe room, you can't carry your children and a shotgun in a firing position. You can't manipulate a shotgun and a flashlight and a telephone and light switches, and doorknobs, and touch a wall for balance, and keep from falling down the stairs by grabbing the banister. Uh, 
anyone who was ever in the army long enough for them to section eight them out when they realized they were nuts has learned how to take a long gun away from an enemy soldier it's, it's really very simple with the pistol if the person just knows how to hold it properly in a dangerous situation uh, it would take an advanced martial artist or a convict who had trained deeply in prisons uh, to, to get that gun away from the defender the pistol gives you much greater mobility it, there is just a whole lot more you can do with it. The range of motion. The range of motion, the, uh, the fact that the other hand is free to perform all the other threat management tasks. Uh, again, bear in mind, the reason we tell you don't go looking for the burglar in your house is because you have to assume he's armed or has access to some sort of weapon. Now, if the police department knew there was an armed man in your house, they would not send one guy with a shotgun or one guy with a pistol, for that matter. Uh, they would send a minimum five-man team, armed and armored, with backup, controlling lights, access to dogs, mirrors, lights, exotic uh, equipment including flashbang, concussion grenades, communication with the outside, the option of gas, the option of sending in canine. If you want to try to do that yourself with your shotgun or your chief special, you go right ahead. I'm going to wait for you here. Uh, where I see the shotgun as an auxiliary weapon is once you have been able to carry out that plan. The children are safely in the, in the safe room with you and the spouse. Uh, the, uh, <clears throat> you know, you're behind cover. You have the call into the police. You have stayed on the line. To, very important to continue your relays of communication with responding police. And at that point, the intruders kick in the door. Now, if you are properly trained, if you can manage the recoil or confident with the weapon, and it's no trick, you just have to be smarter than the shotgun. Uh, at that point, you have massive rapid-fire capability for neutralization at close range. Uh, for that reason, I would say if you were to have only one gun, have the handgun. Uh, the handgun is infantry, if you will, the shotgun is artillery. Uh, I like to have both, so I keep both accessible. What kind of round uh, do you prefer with a shotgun? I, obviously, there's, uh, there's hundreds almost uh, of different types of ammunition, but uh, is, are you looking for tw uh, a double-out buck? Is it a 12-gauge, a 20-gauge, a 410? What do you think is best for home defense and also considering over-penetration? Well, you have to, again, consider the tactics involved. And whenever you select, you know, 38 versus 45, revolver versus auto, uh, you have to look at who's using the tool. Uh, well, so if I were to ask you, Lenny, what's the best camera? You would ask me, well, I don't know. Are you going to take snapshots of your kids at the beach, or are you going to make a professional video production? There's kind of a wide range here, folks. Uh, the tool has to be tailored first to the job and second to the user. The 12-gauge uh, the shotgun in the hands of a, a trained person is a devastating weapon. A great many people, including a majority of big, strong men, find it pain, sufficiently painful that they're hesitant with it or they'll flinch with it at, at the worst possible moment. The 20-gauge uh, shotgun is actually very underrated. As we demonstrated to our people today, there is remarkably little difference in the destructive power. Uh, the 20-gauge has very little recoil. The, the light models, the one I recommend is the Remington LT20, uh, the lightweight semi-automatic. In the special field model, it weighs five and a half pounds. It's as handy as a little M1 carbine. Uh, you can fire it much more rapidly. Uh, you, for example, might be able to shoot a 12-gauge faster on more targets than I could with a 20, but you'll never reach the point where you can shoot more multiple targets faster with a 12 than with a 20. Uh, the 20 gives you more rapid engagement of multiple opponents. Every blast from a 20 gauge is, in effect, 244 magnums at once in terms of delivered energy. Uh, the 410 certainly would have a place with someone who was, you know, physically debilitated. Uh, someone who, let's say, was terribly arthritic or very frail. Uh, the average woman, uh, the average man, uh, even a petite female, would have no trouble working the 20 gauge with training. An untrained person who is not confident with it. Hell, a 410 is better than nothing. Are you using buck or what kind of ammunition? I use buck. I uh, diverge from uh, some of the others on this. Uh, the old theory used to be uh, load the gun with birdshot because right in close, birdshot is devastating and it won't go through your walls and kill your kids. Well, first, that's crap. Look, anything that is going to enter the other man's body is going to go through the walls and kill your kids. 
Uh, God knows none of us have ever done it, folks, but how many of, how many of us know somebody who's a real asshole and he got pissed off and put his fist through a wall? Now, you're a big guy, Lenny. Uh, did you ever put your fist through a man? No. Okay, so we're talking something that will go through the tensile resistance of a human body, and we're somehow hoping it's not going to go through you know, the, the thin plaster and sheetrock. Don't kid yourself. And now this false illusion that it won't harm your children gives you the false confidence to fire wildly in any direction. I use the term advisedly when I say consider the shotgun to be artillery. Artillery is employed from a fixed and static location into a known and plotted field of fire. You would not use the shotgun until they're kicking in the master bedroom door. We've counted noses. Yep, all of us are in here. That means the guy kicking in the door is not one of us. And all we need to worry about now is backstop if we miss. Behind, I, I have laid that out in my house. Behind the wall where I would have to fire in that situation is my private office. Now, if I'm here, I'm not in my private office, so it should be safe. And just to make sure, along that wall, I've put a lot of real heavy books as backstop on the opposite side of that wall. So the buckshot, which will give me uh, effective anti-personnel capability at a distance, and see from here to that far door over there, which would be a reasonable shot down a family's hall, by that point, once the pellets have started to spread, the tiny birdshot pellets will have no, no real effect. From me to you, sure, you'll have the rat hole wound. Might actually be worse than a rifled slug because the, the pellets are spreading faster and there would be a larger tunnel wound effect. From here to that door, each of the pellets will have to do it by itself. And if he's wearing a heavy leather jacket, he might as well be wearing a second chance vest. I want him and I want to take him. Similarly, if he's ducked behind a sofa with a gun in his hand, still menacing the lives of my children and the other people in my household, if there were two of them coming through that door, and one has gone down in the doorway and the other has ducked behind the wall out of sight, I want something that I know will reach through that wall and take him. They're training in the prisons to shoot through the walls at us. Before it occurs to him to do that, I want to reach through that wall, reach through that furniture, and keep him from harming my children. The answer is not in selecting magic bullets that will somehow seek out scumbags and avoid innocence. They don't exist. The answer is in tactics, in planning, and preparation. Will a shotgun, or is a shotgun, a one-shot man-stopper? Nothing is a one-shot man-stopper. Uh, New York City had one case of the subject uh, struck three times with a uh, 12-gauge double-out buck through the torso, a total of 9, 18, 27, 33-caliber projectiles. Uh, didn't go down until he was hit with a 38-watt uh, cutter that broke his pelvis. Uh, they have had five men hit with 12-gauge rifled slugs who were able to remain ambulatory for a period of time. Uh, nothing's 100 percent. You'll, you'll see men who are like bullet sponges, the, uh, the crack monster uh, a few years ago in the Bronx, uh, in the Grand Concourse incident, who was shot 18 times, kept shooting back, is reloading, and still up and running after 18 hits when a rifled slug through the heart finally put him down. A slug, uh, 50 caliber almost, right? Uh, try 72. 72 caliber. Wow. And that finally put him down. Uh, on the other hand, you will uh, you'll have one like one of my friends uh, who, you know, back in the old days before he had any training, thought the proper way to clean his gun was to spray it all over with WD-40 and it would save a little time if he just didn't take out the cartridges. So he's licensed to carry in the city of New York. He has opened it, sprayed everything, including the cartridges, so they'll be nice and clean, too, with metal penetrating WD-40. Uh, does not realize that he has now killed his primers and deactivated his ammunition. And when attacked by a man with a knife on a subway, uh, you know, probably 20 years before the Bernard Getz incident, drew his chief special, pointed at the man, and went, click! Uh, he told me, and he was not the first to say so, that that click was the loudest thing he'd ever heard given the circumstances. <laughs> but the opponent with the knife looked at him and went, rolled his eyes into his head and fainted. <laughs> so you can consider that a one-shot stop, but <laughs> you've, you've got so many factors. We'll, we'll never quantify stopping power. Uh, the momentum theories of Hatcher, uh, followed in a modern times by the Cooper short form, have a place. There is, if the person is off balance, the momentum of a powerful bullet strike 
can in fact take them off balance further and could actually knock a man down. The, uh, the old theory was big heavy bullets have knocked down power and little fast bullets don't. And then the theory was, well, there can't be knocked down power. Uh, you know, a 230 grain bullet could not possibly knock down a 230 pound man. We have a tool, uh, thanks to Rich Davis and the Second Chance Vest, uh, we've had for the last 19, 20 years that we did not have before. The, the body of gunfight survivors shot on the Second Chance Vest. You can now tell us exactly what it's like to absorb the full blast of a shotgun, the full focus of a pistol bullet in a small enclosed area. The majority of them are describing it as like a very powerful punch. Now, it ranges all the way from uh, Jim Martin, who told me when he was shot in the chest with a 357, he saw the flash of the smoke, didn't hear the, did not hear the shot, and did not feel anything in his body. All the way up to a kid who uh, was shot in the back with a 22 and told me it felt like a, being hit with a ball-peen hammer. Uh, the reason was, uh, you know, it's, it's really simple. This is why I'll never quantify any of this. If, if you're, first, if you're off balance, a blow that a man describes as equivalent to a punch will knock you on your back. And as a martial artist, you know that's true, Lenny. You also know if you do a little bit of sancha and breathing, get into a horse stance, tighten up, key up, and let me hit you as hard as I can, my fist will bounce off, and you'll look at me with a nasty look in your eye, and you'll say, now it's my turn. We found that if the guy was up and running and ready to fight, momentum didn't affect him. He'd be bumped by the bullet and keep going. And if he was caught off guard, off balance, and was hit, you would, in fact, have some sort of a knockdown effect. But it was less the effect of the bullet than the effect of the position of the man. You'll find, uh, well, the, the theory popular in the 70s of uh, relative incapacitation index, which I still can't say with a straight face, uh, done on uh, the older form of, you know, the Warren Commission formula, if you will, of ballistic gelatin before the much more realistic FACLA formula. Uh, they said that, well, gee, the gelatin has a hole like this blown in it, so that's the amount of tissue damage it would do, and that's the temporary wound cavity. And on that basis, uh, the RII study indicated that round nose lead 38 special was a more effective man stopper, albeit only by 0.1%, than 45 uh, now you see why I'm having such a hard time keeping a straight face when I discuss RIR. Uh, the current theory is that temporary wound cavity is meaningless, tissue is elastic, it snaps back, it's not destroyed. Da -da. That's bullshit, too. Uh, as a martial artist, you know very well that if you hit me right now as hard as you can on the solar plexus, I will have no permanent wound cavity. There will be a temporary displacement of tissue. And I will fall to the floor on my knees, wheezing and gurgling, and will have been effectively neutralized. So don't tell me that temporary wound cavity is meaningless. It depends where it takes place. If the bullet strikes here at the nipple and goes through nothing but the soft, spongy tissue of the lung and the dead space of the air, nothing, meaningless. Bring it down three or four inches, and it hits the liver, which is plastic instead of elastic, the consistency of gelatin, and will be torn apart by that force. I'll probably be down. Uh, the other theory, the one out of New York City, was placement. Placement was everything, they said. Uh, if you put the bullet exactly in the T-zone of the uh, you know, upper central nervous system, they'll be neutralized. Nice theory, but it doesn't work. Uh, you're going to tell me I have to hit the upper third of the spinal cord. Okay, the upper third of the spinal cord is about the width of this little finger. It is encased in heavy bone that moves in a serpentine fashion inside the body while I duck away from the gun you are pointing at me. It is on the distal side of what may be a clothed body, heavy or small. Okay, you, you've seen the best in the world, Lenny, and so have your, your viewers through your videos. And no man could count on doing that. That's why none of the professionals they ever saw in a Lenny McGill video carry a 22 or a 38 with round nose lead unless the issuing authority forced them, they forced them to carry a 38 with round nose lead. Uh, you could shoot me right now in the head with a 22 uh, CB cap right here. And I'd probably toss you a coin 50-50, one of two things would happen. One, I would fall down and be neutralized. Or two, I would draw this 45 automatic and you would spend your wake in a closed coffin. And 
that's what placement is worth if the bullet does not have the wherewithal to, to make the placement meaningful. So what, what I'm saying, I guess, is when people say this is everything, velocity is everything, caliber is everything, placement is everything, permanent cavity is everything, temporary cavity is everything, look, nothing is everything, but everything is something. Any of those effects can take place. It depends. The reason we'll never quantify it is I think the real reason so much of it, probably 50%, maybe more, of what makes one guy go down and one guy stay up fighting has nothing to do with the bullet. It has to do with, with the mind of the man. Are they in good physical shape? Is there good cardiovascular conditioning? Are they or are they not supercharged on drugs? Do they have a rage to live, a rage to kill? Are they pussies or are they fighters? Are they in a balanced position that can take an impact or are they caught off guard and off balance like a guy dropped with a sucker punch? And that's why you're never going to quantify stopping power. Have the, follow the old rule. The most powerful weapon you can control an accurate rapid fire on multiple targets. Keep shooting until the subject is down and incapable of harming you. And we'll discuss it with the jury later. Okay, real quick. Keys to surviving a gunfight. Mental preparation. Preparedness and awareness. You're prepared, you know it may happen someday. You're prepared to go all the way to, to what we call the gravest extreme. You've, you've seen it through to the third dimension of the reality. Not thinking the gunfight would begin with a draw and end with the last shot. But you've realized, yes, could I go through a criminal trial? Could I go through a civil trial? Could I stand the post-shooting trauma? And do I even know what post-shooting trauma is? Or do I try to deny it because I want to be a warrior prince? Awareness and preparedness, to me, is the first. Second, tactics, proper use of tactics. Extend the distance to where your marksmanship beats his advantage of action versus reaction when he's the initiator and you're the defending reactor. Uh, be behind solid cover. Be where you can shoot him and he can't shoot you. Skill with the safety equipment. Uh, how many people do you know that are carrying guns they can't shoot, guns they may never have fired? My God, their guns walking around waiting to be taken away or to endanger bystanders. And finally, only when all the other three have been satisfied, optimum equipment. Some things work for some people better than others, for some situations better than others. Uh, if I had to carry a gun to the beach and not look out of place, gee, I might have a, a stainless uh, Smith & Wesson Centennial 38 2-inch. And I'd look kind of out of place with my 458 Ruger Model 77 elephant rifle. And if, like I did once, I have to go into the bush uh, in the eastern Transvaal after a friend of mine who has just got to shoot a Cape Buffalo today and I can't talk him out of it because I'm too smart to mess with Cape Buffalo of my own volition, I'm not going in there with the 2-inch 38 Special. Give me back my, my 458 Ruger. Awareness and preparedness first. Then tactics. Then skill with the safety equipment, which includes, but is not limited to, your firearm. And we teach the firearm as safety rescue equipment, not as weapons. And finally, optimum selection of equipment. Those would be the four criteria that I would seek for survival.